the, the, a lot of the conversations we've been having during the past weeks, um, whether they were about leadership, whether they were about um, the social contract, whether they were about experimentation, was uh, these questions of the future of governance. Um, because suddenly the roles that the different levels of government uh, were having were either shifted or confusing or challenging. Um, so we thought we'd take this, uh, this particular lens today and, and gather some of, uh, all of, some of those uh, many questions that we've had over the, those sessions. Um, and we're really lucky um, to be joined by three amazing people, all with experiences in working with local government um, uh, for a, many, many years at this point um, in, in three different contexts as well. Uh, today. So that's Dom Campbell, who's the CEO of FutureGov, Stephanie Wade, who's the Government Innovation Lead at Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, and it's Stefan Insang, who's uh, the Director of the 27th Region in France, um, to basically explore these questions of local government. Um, and one question for me that sits particularly uh, on, on, on sort of acute um, is this notion of centralized decentralization. A lot of people have been talking about over the years as the possible future government uh, or governance uh, model. Um, is, and I'm wondering whether this is actually happening now uh, and what does it actually look like? Um, but obviously there are many other questions we will get, which we'll get into. Uh, but but I, I think without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll sort of pass it over to the, to the first speaker, which will be Stephanie Wade, um, uh, to, to talk from their experiences uh, in the US um, and thanks, James, for just shifting that. Uh, as you can see, here's the outline uh, as we go through. So as you can already see, there will be time for uh, discussion uh, and reflection. So um, feed in the questions along the way, and we'll, we'll try to, uh, to capture them in the, in the chat and bring them into the conversation. Um, and uh, there's also a working document, I believe, that will be sort of written as, as uh, the session goes along, which you can follow along and add into as well. Um, so, without further ado, Stephanie, um, take, take us through uh, some of the things you're seeing um, uh, in your context and, and, and what comes to mind with, with this topic. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I am the Government Innovation Lead at Bloomberg Philanthropies, and I've been working uh, we work with cities around the world to bring them the best practices in, uh, in government innovation so that they can continue to grow and to you know, provide better services to their residents. I've also worked in the U.S. federal government in innovation where I was the director of an innovation lab. So I've worked at the federal level in innovation and I've worked now at the, the local level. And um, it has definitely been a great opportunity to get a sense, especially in the United States, which is, I'm, I live in New York City, I'm uh, US born and bred, and um, have, this has been my home base my whole life. So I want to say that my perspective is definitely from what we're seeing on the ground and what I've experienced in, in America, which is hopefully different from what you've experienced in your country. Um, uh, but, you know, this notion of a federal, a strong federal government with a distributed um, local model of, of cities and counties and states has, has constantly been an evolution, um, I think, in some way, shape, or form, and, and the sentiment around where true change can happen, where innovation is really happening, has continued to shift. You know, um, I will say that the federal government was focused on innovation, I mean, from a long period of time, right? There's been, the, um, there, there's been a lot of pockets of innovation in the federal government, but I'm, I'd say right now, it absolutely is the time for local governments to step up. And in the United States, that's what we're seeing. You know, federal governments have the ability to coordinate and deliver services at scale, especially in large countries. Um, and it would be really easy if, um, if that was effective, if they're able to be the leaders um, that could kind of set the right tone and for it to be a, a role model to other local, uh, local governments to be able to, to, to implement. Um, but the federal governments are far removed, really, from, from the people that they're serving. And they tend to focus on policymaking and resource distribution 
rather than the execution, the day-to-day -day governance that is so embedded in, in local government. And that's where a change can happen most quickly, and that's what we're seeing right now as COVID-19 plays out. You know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. All governments would be innovating and um, coordinating, and it's just not the case. Um, and again, I'm going to caveat that in America right now, uh, it's a, the choice has been made for us as to who is the leader and where innovation is happening. It's happening at the state and local level. And, and anything I say that's political is Stephanie Wade's personal opinion, not that of Bloomberg philanthropies. It's impossible for me to talk about um, state and local innovation response without criticizing the federal government in the United States right now. Um, so that is my own personal opinion. Um, but the, the local governments have stepped up in an incredible way um, in this pandemic. And, and while they have been embracing innovation, and that's what we've been working on for years at Bloomberg Philanthropies, they have catapulted themselves like never before. Um, you know, we have the highest number of COVID-19 cases in the world, over 1.5 million in our country alone, and there's only 4.5 million in the world. Um, and, you know, our federal government didn't prepare for this pandemic. They had actually fired a number of federal health care officials who were in charge of detecting and responding to pandemic crises. Um, they were slow to believe that this was going to be an issue. They were slow to prepare. Once they, once this started becoming uh, overtly a problem, they were um, sending conflicting information to states. They were sending misinformation to states. They weren't sending things to states and cities. Um, and it's been kind of a daily battle. And so in this vacuum of leadership, and vacuum of trust from, from a higher level, the cities and the states have said, we're going to take care of this. And so um, that's really what's happened. I, I think I have several examples that I'll, I'll share. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the past, uh, in Long Beach, California, as in many other cities around the world, homelessness has been a, a really big challenge. And they struggled for years to try to tackle this problem. They had um, trouble affording new housing, um, the state and federal funds that were coming to cities to tackle this issue were fragmented. There were a lot of mental health complications that weren't addressed in the system. And the politicians all had different perspectives about how best to solve the problem, but all of them were pointed in different directions and so nothing could really be done. But COVID-19 happened and literally in about 48 hours. Um, that city set up emergency shelters and empty hotels. They've been housing over 200 people a night. They've partnered with local schools and churches, and they're providing meals. They've hired mental health clinicians and case managers who are co-locating, um, which was a real problem before in trying to, once they had homeless people there, in, in continuing to give them comprehensive services. Um, that's all happening, and a couple of them have actually gotten new jobs. Um, they're seeing some really interesting progress. But it's happening all across cities and states in this country, and I know in some of yours as well because I've seen it. Um, but, you know, things like uh, moving services online to a digital platform were, was so challenging that, uh, and you all have seen some of these conversations play out, where, um, you know, department leads would say, it's just going to take so long and to, to, to try to transition the service. And in-house IT people would say, we don't have the right services or software or, or databases. Things aren't linked. We can't do this X, Y, and Z. But we're seeing people move past that, right? They're setting up um, online services almost overnight that were, were unthinkable before. Um, they are moving through policy changes as well. They're ba temporary banning evictions and foreclosures, things that we never really thought could happen, and they're doing it overnight. They're building entire food distribution programs for school children um, who aren't getting access to that food anymore because they're not in school. They're, you know, states are creating pop-up testing sites to, to serve thousands of residents a day, and this is being done by the state and local officials, not the federal government. The federal government is slowly been sending um, supplies, 
but they are not the ones on the ground who have to execute the service delivery. And so the states and cities have done an incredible job. Um, you know, it seems like the cities and states understand that this is an all hands on deck moment where everybody knows they have to get things done and get them done fast. And that's really shifted the mindset, that shifted their ability to, um, to gain momentum in making changes. And they're really embracing the innovation mindset of let's quickly understand what a problem is, let's go test it out. If it doesn't work, let's adjust it. And if it works, let's scale it. And they're doing it and they're having to because they're having to. And it's, it's really pretty impressive. They're also, um, using their platform to scale their impact by partnering really quickly, which seems much more difficult before this crisis, um, really quickly setting up partnerships with um, private sector individuals and businesses um, to launch ideas. So Seattle, Washington partnered with um, Goodwill, which is a kind of a, it's a nonprofit uh, where people put, donate clothes and, and, and uh, household items so that they can be sold really cheap to people who um, are in, you know, in need of, of cheaper clothes, et cetera. Um, they partnered with Goodwill and labor unions, and they collected 700,000 pieces of personal protective equipment for frontline workers. And Anchorage, Alaska coordinated with private sector engineers, medical professionals, and just resident hobbyists, some of them were teenagers, to develop and design a 3D printed N95 mask in multiple sizes. Um, and they're using those as backup supplies. And it's pretty incredible how fast that's happening. And this is the, these are examples, and there's so many more, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end now, but i um, happy to talk about it. This, this is the example of what government can and should look like. And it's happening at the local level. Um, it's not happening at the federal level. Um, the, they're, they're becoming more creative, they're embracing collaboration, and this commitment to quickly pivoting to overcome challenges and create changes. They're embracing this mindset in ways that we haven't before, and, and I think from my focus, um, I really want to see them capitalize on this moment to hold on to these mindsets and these changes that they've, they've been making, um, this momentum, and carry it forward afterwards. And I think there's some things they could do to embed that principle so it doesn't end when the crisis ends. And I will stop there. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, really enlightening um, and kind of a good mobilizer of this conversation, uh, also bringing some of the feelings into it, which I think, you know, is bound to be happening. Um, I'm particularly struck by the, the most of your examples kind of in a way showcasing partnering like it's never been done before, um, whether it's with private sector or third sector, or possibly even government, uh, sometimes getting out of the way to, to let other kind of organizations lead. We, we might get onto those questions, uh, but, but for now, um, let me, let me put, hand it to, uh, to Dom, uh, who's gonna uh, pick, up the, pick up the baton here and, and uh, share some experiences from the, from the UK. Dom. Hi everyone, uh, good to see you all, wherever you are. Um, so I've, I've really struggled to put together my thoughts for this, I have to say. Uh, I've been texting Jesper even right to the last minute saying, please don't make me go first, because uh, I've been trying to think and do it at the same time, which is kind of representative of still being in the thick of it in many ways. Um, so those of you who don't know me, I'm chief exec of a company called FutureGov, um, and uh, I've spent the last uh, eight weeks back in the trenches of government um, supporting one bit of London in particular. I see Knowles on the call, uh, so working with the crew in Camden in their response in uh, North London. Um, but also elsewhere, my team has been in places like NHSX, which is the sort of innovation and technology arm of the NHS, uh, looking at innovations around mental health, social isolation, supporting people to stay happy and healthy and connected through the crisis, uh, as well as um, some things that may or may not have been controversial and in the media in recent days and weeks, um, but have managed to escape from cleanly and ethically. Um, but, uh, but we've been sort of in the middle of the sort of fray of looking at how public services are uh, 
are responding, how they're adapting, how they're coping with what's in front of them. Um, what I'd like to say is that everything that I wish uh, for local government in the last 20 years of my career, which has been my obsession, uh, has almost come true in the last couple of months, uh, that it is the perfect machine for crisis response, that it, uh, that it uh, now has an unprecedented opportunity to take the power that has so long been uh, taken from it. Um, but I probably have a bit of a mixed uh, review of all of that, I would say. Um, there's no doubt that uh, I've been reminded just the unbelievable commitment, passion, expertise there is in our local public services and how they deserve all of the credit, autonomy and resources that they uh, need in order to support their communities through things like the crisis. Um, but just at that level, just as we've seen at the national level as well, I think the main challenge that remains and the thing that has been accentuated more than ever is essentially that government and public services have never been designed, uh, let alone designed for the internet age. And that's been more obvious now than ever. Um, you know, we've had people, uh, whole institutions struggling around the country uh, to move beyond doing emails at home on a Friday and claiming that they're a virtual digital age organization to suddenly having to have 5,000 people work at home and run public services five days a week, 24 seven, and suddenly recognizing that those two things are not the same, um, as well as really trying to rethink their business model, their operating model, their relationship to central government and to their citizens and community groups simultaneously on the one hand being pincered in the UK between the sort of extremely fleet of foot WhatsApp groups and mutual aid groups, which have been unbelievable in their ability to mobilize, uh, to, you know, which is on the one hand made local government look bad and turgid and slow. Um, but on the other hand, it has retained its role as, you know, focused on safeguarding, focused on getting things right, doing things appropriately and at scale and then reliability. And so how, how it has then been able to bring those two worlds together has been a sort of defining moment in many ways uh, for local government around the country. Again, mixed scorecard on that one. Some were ready for it, some weren't. And then at the same time, there's been this unprecedented push from the centre um, in the UK, which has a very, very centralised model. Our, our central government versus local government workforce stats crossed in about 2012 for the first time in history. Uh, where now more people in the UK work for central government than local government. Um, and that trend just continues. Uh, in many ways, I've seen this crisis as a, as a land grab from two angles. One is from Westminster and one from uh, technology corporate uh, interests, I would say, in many respects. Uh, large international private uh, forces that have certainly entered into our public services at a speed that I've never quite seen before. Uh, and has shown the sort of challenges that local government faces in terms of having the expertise and uh, sort of resource to be able to manage the sort of overwhelming weight of central government intervention and community action and corporate IT interests um, and has done a remarkable job despite all of that. The, the role we sort of played in Camden kind of summed up quite nicely by the quote from Dave Snowden which is that in a crisis you should always deploy an innovation team alongside the business recovery teams to capture, capture novel practice um, because that's essentially and I saw that quote about four weeks into working in Camden uh, and realized that was essentially what we've been doing which was uh, bolstering uh, the organization to be able to not just do the now response but actually look ahead as Noel's team from the inside was doing as well uh, in order to be able to think about not in some kind of awkward crisis opportunity way, but actually think about how can we do this deliberately and how can we try and look at least two weeks ahead rather than two days ahead to think about which, the, which of these things in front of us are things that we want to uh, safeguard, codify, protect, build upon in the future. Uh, how do we build on the great practice that already existed in different places? Camden, you may know, has been a leader in things like participatory democracy around climate assemblies and other things. So I had a very strong basis to have that kind of citizen interaction uh, and again almost tested their model 
uh, fast, hard and broad and across everything very, very immediately and, and was able to show to them where their strengths and weaknesses were. I think across the country nationally, technology and data was a real issue. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully at last people understand what those things mean because they've been on the real receiving end of it, both as citizens and as senior officers within local government and having to recognize that it isn't enough to just put that at the end of a thought process um, and actually do something with it as the sort of clay that molds our public services and how we respond in crisis rather than just an add-on that you give someone in the cell of the job to deal with. Um, the other things I wanted to really talk about was like just how, how we're seeing a real shift from a sort of left-right narrative in the UK to a national versus local. Um, and, uh, and that is almost like the new political divide. Um, there's, a, again, like this state, state restructuring and this contesting of, of governance at all levels. You see the sort of lack of codified constitution and role of local government versus national being tested in every sentence that's written and every guidance that's given every budget that's set uh, and again like how do we actually use this moment to think about you know very deliberately about what is best placed at national regional and local and community levels and how do we actually think about things like community as a platform for action uh, councils as a platform for action relational state using the sort of national bulk weight of buying power and delivery on the one hand but empowering a sort of uh, federated state in order to make action happen. Do I necessarily believe that's going to happen in the UK? I don't. I don't think we're set up that way and as I say I think the centralizing forces are, are stronger than the, the sort of unified local voice. Um, we have 400 local authorities here, I know there's 500 in Oz, 500 I think in France. Like how do you get a unified, well it's probably more in France depending on how you count it actually, um, but uh, how do you get a unified voice for that localism, which is a thing that we've really struggled with, I think, uh, through this crisis. Um, in terms of looking ahead, I think the areas of opportunity are things like uh, this, this relational state notion, like how do we use all the people, buildings, resources that we have available to us in order to, to sort of exponentially superpower communities to achieve their own aspirations. Uh, and, that, and I can see places like Camden already refiguring their strategy, their structures, their ways of thinking, knowing that the, the money remains tighter than ever, uh, but the social pressures are greater than ever. Uh, Westminster's proven that it isn't capable of rapidly setting up national social programs beyond giving people a bit of cash to be able to restructure the state at that level. So how do we make a really positive case for change at a local, a local level to, to make that happen? Um, and some of the sort of, uh, sort of policy trends I see is like we, we've done a bit of a disservice in terms of the sort of simplicity of thinking that we do. We've retained our sort of linearity. Um, we, we haven't done a great job of thinking in three dimensions and playing a chess game during this period. Uh, we've done the thing the local government does brilliantly, which is solve the problems in front of us. Uh, but it isn't thinking about the bigger powers that are happening around us uh, and how can we play and win in that game uh, in many respects. Um, the last thing I wanted to say really was just to kind of exemplify that there's a there's a plan uh, that some of you may have seen I'll publish in the channel later um, which talks about that it's the recovery plan in the UK our plan to rebuild and snuck in on page 45 section 14 is a thing called sustainable government structures uh, which says COVID-19 has been perhaps the biggest test of governments worldwide since the 1940s as the government navigates towards recovery, it must ensure it learns the right lessons from this crisis and acts now to ensure that government structures are fit to cope with a future epidemic, including the prospect of an outbreak or a second epidemic. This will require a rapid re-engineering of government structures and institutions to deal with this historic emergency and also build new long-term foundations for the UK so that we can help the rest of the world. I mean, forget that last bit. I think Westminster's kind of lost its credibility on helping the rest of the world in the last few years. Uh, but, he, but beyond that, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very stark sentence and a, a paragraph and a very uh, clear uh, statement of intent from um, Westminster in terms of uh, its view on where it's going to lay blame off the back of uh, our stumble to respond to this. Uh, and I think that if we don't uh, quickly come together at a community at a local level, uh, and understand how we can form a strategy and a real vision for 
for local government going forward, working with its communities, then there's a real threat in the UK in particular that our mandate will be removed and our public services become more fragile than ever. Uh, so for me, having been in the trenches for the last eight weeks, uh, I think that's essentially where our focus is going to be in coming months and years. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Um, slightly scary scenario you're sort of ending on uh, kind of um, putting more power to the centralized state and, and if we are, we are sort of failing to mobilize around and between local governments uh, there's, a, there's a lot of risk um, plenty of stuff to, to, to pick up on there uh, as well around the social infrastructure and and the role of digit, data data and digital and etc uh, yeah, so I have a lot of burning questions, but I will hold them for once more uh, to just kind of pass it on to, to Stefan and and then uh, we can get into the discussion. So Stefan, over to you. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, I'm the only guy to show you this old fashioned stuff called a keynote. Uh, but I'm, I am, I'm the only French guy uh, and I struggle with my English, so it's easier for me to help. So, uh, be fair and uh, I hope you can you see my can you see my slide yes yeah okay um, so yes just a few words about La Vincentième Région we are a think and do town based in Paris France and we uh, since uh, more than 10 years we like Dom and like uh, Stephanie we we, we do uh, programs innovation programs and research program with mainly with local, uh, local powers and we are a non-profit and our members are 40 regional governments, cities, counties in, uh, in France. And state of change is also uh, part of our, of our board. Um, so when Jesper asked me what to say those days um, concerning um, change in gov local government those days, I had three uh, insights, three main ideas. And uh, the main idea was to say, OK, uh, I think we all here are uh, public innovators and we are wondering how can I be useful in those days in these uh, difficult uh, moments and maybe the, the, the first thing is to capture and to observe uh, before telling what will be the future and, and this kind of thing. So we at La 27 Region we, we had three ideas to capture what's going on now in, at the local level. The first is to to observe what's already what already happened in resident cities in the past, um, so we, we are lucky enough to be part of a, to be leading a different program where we can spend days in your beautiful countries in UK, in uh, Denmark, in uh, in, uh, in Greece, and we visited places uh, such as North UK, like Wigan, for instance, uh, in the suburbs of Manchester. But we've been in Athens to. And this is place who have uh, suffered from crisis. Uh, if you take Wigan, for instance, Wigan in the, in the suburb of uh, Manchester, and uh, the way uh, they recover or they try to recover from the crisis, the financial crisis, was to create, I would say, a, a new social contract with the inhabitants, and they call it the deal. Uh, they launched it in uh, 2011. And it's, as you see on the picture, it's, it's really a contract. You, you have on the, on the left side what the city engaged to do to the citizen. And on the right, what the citizen has to engage to do to the city. And you got to sign at the bottom of it. Uh, so it's not just a game, it's, it's real. And it's a very, I mean, the, it doesn't mean that it's a miracle and that everything is working in this project, but it's very interesting because they, work a lot on the re relocalization of the economy. Uh, so they work a lot on procurement. How do you innovate on procurement? Not just to make it easier or more accessible, but to relocalize investment. Uh, they work a lot on social contracts. They do a lot of system change because it's not only changing procurement, but it's changing the management. Uh, it's changing the kind of relationship with citizens. So we, we strongly think that it makes sense to observe all the cities uh, in France, in Europe. Uh, there are so many situations of uh, resilience, the former mining cities. In this, on this picture, you see a, a small city in the, the north of France called Los Angeles. 
um, which suffered from, uh, which was a former mining city, and they suffered a lot from this, from the end of the mining, and the coal mining. And since 20 years, they became a leader in a transition town cities. So they, they, they learned a lot and they did a lot to become more uh, ecological, more to reduce their carbon print and, and to be more innovative and to hire citizens in the governance of the city. Uh, but you can go in uh, Athens and in Greece to, to see what, what, how, how some cities recover or try to recover after the bankruptcy. Uh, you can even go in, uh, I mean, there, there are plenty of places where we already had a crisis, local crisis, uh, and it makes sense, we think, to, uh, to learn from all these existing places. Uh, a second idea would be to learn from pioneer movements, uh, and some of them are connected to, to, to the, the idea of resilience. I mentioned transition towns. Uh, if you remember, Totnes in UK was one of the first who, 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 who was uh, leading um, a movement to change uh, the behavior of the city, the, the policy of the city, in a more, uh, in the sense of more innovation, more citizen-driven, uh, more ecological, and so on. Uh, I would mention the movement of public, what we call public commons governance. Some say is also co-cities. Is uh, it's not just innovating in the management on the, in the organization, but also innovating the governance. Uh, if you take the city of Bologna, for instance, they, uh, there is a tradition in Bologna of uh, contracts with the citizen. They call, they call it the pact. And it's five, I think it's 500 contracts signed with, with groups of citizens to co-govern uh, equipments, uh, public spaces, or any uh, thing that could co-governed by the city and the people. Um, uh, there is the, uh, we, we discovered a few months ago something called the Wealth Community Building, which is what has been developed in the city of Wigan, for instance, and it's, it's very uh, developed by an agency in Manchester called the CLES, which is a center for local economies. It's a it's kind of think tank, but working on uh, innovation in, in the economy. And it's, it, what they try to do is to uh, help cities to relocalize investment, to relocalize um, uh, capacities, uh, to, uh, to, re uh, to develop citizenship. There is also the movement of municipalism, uh, uh, which is famous in Spain, for instance, because uh, cities like Barcelona or Madrid uh, during former election has been waned by uh, citizen uh, lists. Uh, they lost last year, they lost the campaign, but it, uh, uh, even if they lost the campaign, there is an, a growing movement uh, with this, uh, for instance, in France, I think 300 lists uh, uh, has been promoted by citizens and not politicians during the last municipal election. So uh, uh, that's an interesting movement. There is something called uh, the donut theory. I don't know if you heard about it. It's led by a researcher called Kate Reworth and the city, uh, it's a bit complicated to, 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 to explain it now, we can do it later, but it's how do you deal uh, to provide what people really need in your cities, but considering the constraints and the limits of the ecology, for instance. So uh, uh, there was an announcement for the Climate uh, 40, uh, the, the group of cities, uh, the worldwide group of cities who who said that they would uh, promote, including Los Angeles, for instance, and they said that they would promote this kind of strategy uh, that would be uh, recovering not only through economy, but also through ecological transition and social, uh, social justice. Of course, there is this movement of innovation labs and resilience teams that uh, Tom and, and Stephanie and us really, uh, uh, that we are really engaged in. So there are hundreds and teams, innovation teams, uh, uh, research and development teams in cities now. So how, how, what do we learn from this? So I, I'm sure you can add your own uh, uh, movement and, 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 and we, can, uh, we can develop this list, but we think this is a second thing that could be done to, to, to learn about what's happening now. And the last one is, uh, okay, we can learn from what's happening a bit under the radar. So uh, this is something we, try, we are trying to do with 10 cities in France is to capture 
uh, to put sensors, exactly like Stephanie and Dom says, there are things happening now and we need to capture it. Uh, it's just that it's at different levels. There are things that are moving in management, things that are moving in governance. How did people take this, took decision during this period? Um, if you take digital services, there is an interesting thing in France now is that many social rights have been automatically reconducted. Uh, maybe it could become mainstream. So you wouldn't have to reconduct uh, to, to, so it will be a opt out uh, instead of uh, opt-in uh, digital services. Uh, so what we try to do now is to uh, launch a distributed inquiry in 10 cities in France and I hope with uh, also cities in Europe and elsewhere to capture through uh, inquiry, ground inquiry, what's going on and what, what should be, um, uh, what should be kept after the crisis, but also what should be uh, uh, cancelled. Uh, if you take management, there are many places in cities where there is bad management, and I don't think this management has been improved during the crisis. So how how do we learn on this different uh, at this different level? So this is something we are we are we are trying to do now. Uh, it's just starting. I think we will have six months, seven months uh, to learn from this we're doing it with, with Paris with city of Nantes with Grenoble and uh, yeah we'll see what's what what we can learn from this uh, from this feedback from uh, from the ground that was it thank you very much uh, Stefan uh, for that quick overview and and um, again a lot to, to, to jump into and, and I'm particularly struck by um, how you create resilience, um, but but I'm going to hold with that question um, uh, for a little bit uh, and maybe jump to to another one, which has occurred uh, a little bit in the chat as well, and, and certainly in the previous sessions we've had, um, which is about the, the role of the federal government. So both you, Stephanie, and, and Dom uh, talked about that in different respects, uh, and potentially even painted a scenario where the UK uh, could go in the direction that perhaps you're seeing in other places where uh, if the problems are becoming more complex uh, if and if kind of the need is actually to reach out to citizens and, in, and, re and relate to them uh, it tends to become more local but actually you're describing a, a scenario potentially where the, where the, the UK state can go in, in another uh, another direction um, um, so I'm curious um, uh, also, because we heard a lot about the federal government and what it it's bad at, uh, so let's let if we flip that around, what would a good federal government good look federal like government. right now? Um, uh, also, to kind of be a little bit positive and creative in, in this conversation. So, I'm curious about your thoughts on that and how you would paint that scenario. Yeah. Stephanie, maybe you can go first. Yeah. Go first. Yeah. I I I think the federal government. There's a lot that the federal government could do and should do. Um, I, I think, you know, again, as a caveat, I'm just talking about what our government hasn't done, um, or that's what I was talking about. But I, I think that the, the role of the federal government, there's so much opportunity at the federal level to have impact and innovate and to unify. Um, when it comes to this kind of crisis, first and foremost, they can provide leadership, right? They can provide, they can carry the narrative and help people around the world um, feel a sense of, of trust, a, a sense of, um, uh, you know, they can be transparent and, um, and, and help set the policy tone for, and the emotional tone for a city that can help alleviate people's panicking and fear, um, that can help make it easier for states and, and, and local leaders to do their job. I think the federal government is a great purchaser of goods, right? They can also buy tests and Back, they can fund vaccines and, um, and to launch some of the response needs at scale. They also could do a lot to coordinate um, and, and to help the state and local governments uh, respond. Now, it is in the federal, in the, in the US, uh, the federal government has jurisdictions and authorities that separate, the state has their own and, and the local have their own. That doesn't mean that the federal government can't be there as partners and problem solvers, right? To help them think about rather than like, hey, we'll get you some tests 
and we'll get you some personal protective equipment, we'll buy it from China, we'll buy it from Germany, we'll get the ventilators, et cetera, and we'll ship them to you, it, it, it should go beyond the buyer, the purchaser, to the problem solver. Um, the federal government can use data and the experts that it has on staff from a medical standpoint, from um, whatever you name it, whatever experts you need, to set and lay out policy guidelines and response guidelines. And we see that in the CDC in the United States, they have expert scientists who can say, these are some of the ways you can safely reopen. And by the way, we're happy to work with you state and local governments to figure out how to tailor those needs to your particular response. We just don't see that happening. The CDC is being told not to put things out. They are not, they are not doing it in the United States. But I think there's a lot that the federal government can do um, to become problem solvers uh, alongside the, the local government and to help unify and provide a unified uh, set of dialogue and, 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 and uh, guidance that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Tom, Stefan, anything to add to that? Yeah. Um, the problem with the debate between national and local is that, I mean, if it was a movie, uh, the state would be the bad guy. Uh, so uh, uh, we all prefer to, to, to love the local level because it's, it's, it's more connected to, to what we are and to our day-to-day -day living. But I think maybe we should look at these relationships like uh, uh, an experience designer would do. And what would do an experience designer it would look at the interface between uh, the local and national and see if these interface are more uh, on the side of the state or at the state of the side of, of, uh, of the local. And if you take the interfaces in France, for instance, it's called the parliament. Uh, it's called the, uh, there are big national local contracts where there are billions of euros on the table to co-invest between the state and local level. And the problem we got with this, all these interface is that they are, they are um, led by the national level and not by, so there is no balance in this interface between the national and local. And maybe what we would need in the future is just to make sure that in all these interface that we need to identify very carefully maybe we should make sure that the local level has a balanced power uh, with the national level uh, but be careful with these uh, with this debate on national it's like the debate between europe and and, and national you know it's it's so easy uh, to 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 go straight in this and say no the state is just doing bullshit and uh, yeah, but we need it, <laughs> and, and we really need it. And maybe we should be more specific on the thing that we need to do between local and. The, but this means that we need to have a better understanding on the deep mechanics between local and national, and it's it's not funny. It's uh, some say it's boring innovation, uh, but we need to dig into this. Yeah, I just couldn't care with why this. Stefan said to be honest because yeah I totally agree I mean, to, for a Lego analogy it's that I'd like central government to be a master builder to be honest uh, where they actually think about very deliberately designing governance and designing designing governmental layers so that the the benefits of every layer of government are recognized and deliberately codified and orchestrated in a way that sort of transcends political or personal ideology in many respects, like what you do with those levers once you have them, where you put your money, who you sort of disenfranchise and who you privilege, that's not necessarily the same thing as governance. Um, because you, you know, if that system makes sense and if you have those levers connected to something, you can pull them more effectively for change. Um, whereas what we've seen is almost like a, like a naivety to be honest, in the last eight weeks, like a lack of knowledge at the right, right, in the right rooms in a central government level as to why you would use levers at the regional or local or national levels and where you should put your money, where you should put your effort, who you should support to achieve ultimately the right outcome and be agnostic to all of that. But unfortunately, like the outcome has almost come secondary in the UK uh, and actually the sort of power struggle and the jostle for 
centralization uh, has been interesting. I mean, it's played out big time in things like social care, where we've had a, a national disaster in our care homes of over 20,000 people dying in our care homes. Um, and the first six weeks was characterized by uh, what are care homes. Uh, and the last two weeks have been, oh, local government deals with care homes, it's all your fault. Can you fix it now, please? Uh, and uh, and that, that was just a, a naivety at, a, at the highest level as to not really understanding the difference between the health, the health, the NHS and social care systems, who has responsibility, who could most uh, support impact and outcomes. Uh, and until there's that sort of respect, education, deliberateness of governance design, then, you know, it, it isn't so much good, bad. It's just messy and contested and you end up in the kind of disasters that we've had. Thanks, uh, all of you. I think the well, one thing that strikes me is that the usual um, sort of sentiment around kind of how you respond to crisis is that, you know, you tend to get closer together and help each other out more, which is certainly part of the story, but it also sounds like it could be, uh, you know, the road to division uh, when we're talking about different levels of government, at least. I want to um, sort of shift to a, a different angle, which has also come up a lot uh, during the series, uh, which is about um, how, how um, essentially how government collaborates across, how we learn from each other. Uh, so all of you are, are working with different cities. Um, how are you finding that cities or local governments are learning from each other in this time of crisis? Is there even time to do that? Uh, how do you pick up one solution uh, to use it in the other uh, place and so on? Are there conversations happening? Um, and also, um, uh, is there something we can sort of hold on to as an infrastructure of, of knowledge uh, mobilization? Um, and you talked, Dom, as well about kind of the building coalitions as well uh, in this time. Curious about if you're seeing that and what that looks like. Um, any thoughts? I probably spend like most of my time personally in the last eight weeks being being in that space of trying to build a coalition um, it was Camden's explicit objective to both you know essentially the original phone call that I had from the chief exec uh, 10 days before lockdown which probably should have been two days after lockdown but anyway um, was that uh, there's a choice in front of us which is either deliver minimum viable services that mean we come out of this cleanly as leaders and can say we, we've done everything within our current envelope uh, and the risk framework was managed or we look back and say we did everything we possibly could um, and on an individual level feel that you've at least tried um, and obviously they pushed for that path and, and, and out of that wanted Camden to be leading by example but equally building a coalition of the willing to learn from one another and share and collaborate. Um, because the original model was one of essentially design sprints to, you know, three days after three days to be learn like designing solutions to childcare, solutions to social care, solutions to food delivery and, and spinning them out. Um, but obviously with the timeframes that we had, we needed, you know, mass experimentation going on simultaneously around the country to meet those needs at the same time not you know we'd still only be in design sprints whatever eight by now uh if we'd gone in a sort of linear way um and so i'll post a link in the channel to the sort of coalition that they've been looking to build um but the one thing i'll say is it's been bloody hard like just getting the 33 london boroughs to collaborate is god's own work let alone the other people outside of london because as soon as you say it was from london they say Oh God, London's here again to tell us what to do. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. What I found is, as ever, getting that local health sector and the local education sector and the council and the community uh, to work together in a borough boundary is 10 times easier than to get a sector to work collaboratively uh, across local authorities because they always want to be first and second. They always want to be the one that invented it, but the one that could be reassured that it was safe to do at the same time and those two positions are clearly irreconcilable um, and that makes collaboration through that kind of process quite difficult. Thanks Tom. Stefan you wanted to add? Yeah I think on, on 
the field of cooperation, there are good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that, yes, during this crisis, we have observed suddenly uh, needs for cooperation. And let me mention you an example. A friend of mine sent me a WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp content of the conversation that many top manager had at the regional level with, between all the cities. And all these people suddenly built, created this WhatsApp and, and that many exchange, etc. Another example is that um, there was no many, no, not enough seats and beds in hospital in Paris. So we brought the people uh, from Paris to Nantes uh, to other cities. So that, there was a huge cooperation during the crisis. The only problem is that this happened after years and decades of competition between territories, regions, cities. Um, we, maybe Europe or the competition in Europe has created artificial competition between cities, between governments, and in a moment where we would need cooperation. But it doesn't open overnight. Uh, so there is a risk that this, this, this disappear just after the, in a, in a few weeks. Because it's, there is a tradition of competition. If you're a city, you're, you need to be against the, your neighbors. Uh, there is no strong competition uh, uh, for years. So uh, uh, I think this, this is one of the biggest challenges to make sure that uh, uh, we, we create infrastru infrastructure for cooperation. But uh, I think it would be one of the most difficult things to keep in the, the future of this. Right. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Stephanie, anything to add from, from your experience, the I teams? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of incredible collaboration. I, I think it's, it's never going to be easy, right? At the state level, um, there are governors and mayors who are not getting along, and that's really challenging. These have different fundamental views about reopening right now, and um, and, and, and such. So we're, we're seeing challenges there, but we're also seeing some, some incredible opportunities for collaboration. At the state level in California, um, there's incredible things going on around homelessness um, that, are, that are, are set at the state level and are cascading down through cities. We're also seeing a lot of states cooperating with one another. In the northeast region of the country where we've had the biggest spike in cases, um, the governors got together in multiple states and decided to basically um, kind of set prices to a certain degree. Um, and, and it was positive in this sense, where they said, we're all going to have the same policies so that people in New York don't go to a nearby state because they have a different policy and they're more lax. And you have all of this travel and convolution. They actually set the, the tone and collaborated on all of the uh, together on the different um, policies. And that's been incredibly effect effective, which, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of a time when that's happened um, uh, in our lives. And I, I think that bodes well. We're also seeing across the cities, we're doing as much collaboration as we can um, and sharing good ideas and stories daily across a very large network. Um, and we're seeing cities, we're, we're convening um, chief innovation officers, we're convening uh, that the, the kind of fiscal leaders, we're con there's so many mayors, we're, con we're doing so much to try to help them share because this isn't a time um, to, to reinvent the wheel. Like, this is a time to use something that's already working and we're seeing a ton of that happening, which is really wonderful. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, so we're just about the hour mark um, and as usual, we are going to pause for a a minute um, to just kind of breathe and reflect uh, and then enable uh, us to have a bit more, maybe a little bit of a deeper discussion for the next few minutes or so and also allow people that have to do other things to jump off the call. Um, I'm going to ask James to, sh oh, here we go, he's sharing slides. Uh, before the people that have to run, run too far, uh, here's a bit of an advertisement for next week but we actually talk about some of the things that particularly Dom brought up around data and digital responses. And we are lucky to, to be joined by Misha Kaur, Eddie Copeland and Ben, ben Severni on, on that. Uh, so, um, so certainly a deeper dive into the, the importance of, of, um, of data and, and digital in, in this time as well. Um, 
but for now, um, beyond that, I want to thank um, the ones that have joined and are leaving. Um, and then we're going to pause for a, for a minute uh, to have a bit of reflection space and then we'll rejoin for, for another 20 minutes or so. So thank you. Um, so what I think we will do, um, just to allow people to get a bit more collective reflection time, is to actually do a quick breakout uh, around five to seven minutes uh, in smaller groups to just talk about what you heard and come up with even better questions than the one you already shared um, at this point. And then we'll, we'll kind of go into to plenary after that, uh, if that's all right with, with everyone. Unless I hear any objections, I'm going to go right ahead and do it. Or actually, James is going to go right ahead and do it because I can't do it on my control panel. You want to go groups of three, James, or two? Oh, you already got it settled. I'll shut up. So the chance to just quickly reflect with peers on what you've heard and what's on your mind. Go ahead and join the rooms. She told me. I did. I was just going to out myself. I promised I would deliver one talk in French, and then I didn't do it. But if I am ever back in France, we will plan it. I, you just have to translate so, it. I'll do it. Yeah, we, we'll make it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you guys. I'm, I'm going to speak English and pause you guys. Um, Basically, don't worry. I understand all the talking that's harder for me. Oh, great. But thank you. I, I think I meant to say welcome back, uh, everyone, to uh, to the plenary. Um, I hope you had a bit of a chance to um, to reflect and, and connect. Um, if you have more questions, please feed them into the chat. I'm going to try to pick up a few of them that that came that came uh, even during the session um, and came up a little bit in, in during the conversation, which was about um, um, how to put that. Um, which is about letting go, essentially, or about decommissioning. Uh, and I think it was Noel that, that touched upon that in, uh, with, with, with his work. So maybe you want to elaborate on that, Noel. But, but certainly one of the things that we've been talking about um, uh, a lot has been about kind of what do we need to unlearn um, you know, in this fast-paced uh, development, uh, letting go of things quickly. Um, how do you actually do that? What does that look like? Um, uh, and I know there's a lot of innovation teams involved in this sort of work as well. But, but Noel, I don't know if you want to uh, sort of expand on some of the points you were making and, and, and maybe put that as a question to, to our, our panel as well. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So kind of we, over the last uh, kind of week, we, we started um, kind of going out to kind of the, all, all our services to get a sense of how they'd experienced um kind of COVID-19 the response kind of what and what ways of working they thought um kind of should continue or or should stop um or should re or should be reinvented but including 
that discussion around like what services they they thought should um kind of should be reinvented or recovered or or, or scaled up and and what could be done to support that and there's that just i mean kind of we're doing we're doing the analysis at the moment but um just just kind of from that um seeing some of some of the responses and my, my team have been facilitating the discussions there's been there's been so much openness i think in terms of what people want to do and kind of what what they've done and including leaving behind some of the activities and services that they did themselves as as teams and working with residents to um kind of to, to work that out and what, what's what's kind of really interesting actually is um is the variance between those discussions and that that's also, uh, i suppose i think something that's um that kind of we all need to reflect on is kind of those organizations that had the like the pre-existing set of values and an investment in helping staff work with residents work in that like iterative way kind of were always going to be better placed than others like who are not but particularly in terms of like the values and behaviors because it meant that like overnight um they could scale up things that they were probably doing at the margins but they were doing um and, that, and that's something that we we found within our organization even though as uh, as, as don said camden is very innovative that kind of the like the there are places where probably that culture is 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 kind of less there so that there's some work for us to do but i i, I just i i just think there's massive opportunities to to look to frontline staff see what they need and to help them do that and, and that that's that's for me like how i'm pivoting my team rather than creating um you know like fa fancy frameworks is to, is to start with them help them you know have the conversations with communities and, and partners and look at what um, how, how to help them scale and I, and I suppose that's kind of the, the question is that kind of who, like how we can help our frontline staff innovate what are the what are the tools and capabilities so that we can free them up to do what they do best so that was a question there any any thoughts from the from the panel I don't know if it's an, uh, an answer, but I see many inquiries in cities now. So I, I see many top management that try to collect what's going on in the organization. But connected to what you said, I see very few questionnaire um, for the front office people. So it's just question for the top managers. So the problem we got is that if we don't use this moment uh, to go uh, to, to open a little bit and not just ask to the top manager what they think about the management, we won't make it. So um, this is something we try to to uh, negotiate with some cities where we see that they are actually doing inquiries, but only at the top top level, which has no sense. How do you capture things on the ground, on the front office, and everywhere in technical services? Uh, I think many things that will after uh, occurs after the crisis will depend if we have collected insights and data from this place. If we just ask to the uh, the mayor or to the top manager, we we, ju we will just have things from there. So um, I think it's now very connected to the way that we investigate in cities. Uh, another thing is, is it only an inquiry launched by the top level or will the result be shared for a debate? Uh, or is it just something that the, the top manager will, I mean, he will ask a question and get the answer and nobody knows what he will do with that. And believe me, this will be a mess in many uh, cities where they will use uh, the inquiry as a pretext to do things that they have, they have already decided. So uh, this is a moment for, I would say, maybe I will use big words, but for more democracy within organization, uh, a more balanced conversation between manager and not managers, uh, front office people and top management people. Uh, this is a moment for a true conversation about what can we do together? How do we 
cooperate uh, inside. But I'm a bit afraid that the crisis and all the, this investigation, there is a crisis, will, will be a pretext for something bad. Thanks, Stefan. Um, sort of relates to uh, Ernesto's uh, question about um, you know, uh, how engagement with, with citizens uh, or, or how we create sort of or use platforms to enable citizens to participate um, uh, in a better way. And, and then certainly uh, this is sort of from our, our uh, my experience going back to when, when I was at MindLab, creating, um, well, thinking about the, the interactions and the relationships with, with people as, as a part of uh, the, the, the formal decision-making in, in, in a number of different ways. Um, I guess there's a question of whether this, this moment in time we are seeing a, a space or a different kind of space for experimenting or bringing more things into that. I don't know if you've, you've sort of found, found that, Dom, uh, Steph, Stephanie, um, anyth anyth anything to add on, on that point? No. Stephanie? Help me out, no? Right. Maybe, maybe something <laughs> about uh, just a short thing. I mean, yeah. we, we don't hear the opponents during the crisis. We don't need the opposition. There is no voice from, uh, we hear the majority of cities, but we, there is no space for the, uh, the opponents to say what they think about. So um, again, there is a, a controversy and a risk uh, that crisis does not develop democracy in our cities, but shrink it. Uh, so there is no, uh, there are 50% reason why it could be better, uh, and 50% reason why it could be even worse. So we, we got to be very, uh, very uh, aware uh, mm. how to uh, engage participation, citizen participation, but also uh, Democracy, uh, normal democracy in our in our cities. Great. Um, in, that, in that case, I'm going to jump on that point, uh, Stefan, and, and jump to another question that was also posed uh, a while ago in the chat, which was about, uh, I guess, the urgency. You all kind of described how both for good and for bad, uh, this this urgency has enabled uh, a new movement. Uh, and potentially exploring new role of, of government and, and the responses, uh, like for example, you, you shared, Stephanie, are, are, are a reason to be excited about. Uh, the question is whether we can, uh, I guess, uh, maintain that momentum, uh, maintain that sense of urgency when it comes to dealing with, with other uh, challenges like climate change or, or other um, important pressing issues. Uh, so I wonder if you you have any thoughts on on that, um, or or is it only when this crisis happens that that we can we can that these circumstances uh, or these conditions are are, are developed, um, or is this something we can create, uh, let's say, artificially in in our organizations? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, Jesper. And I mean, crisis changes things in ways that you can't simulate, right? There, there is a, a uniqueness to it and it's generated for a reason, right? Um, and and our, our goal is for us to, I think someone had posted it, maybe Kristen, is build back better, right? How do we, um, how do we, how do we use this? And I, I actually, just as a quick side note, had uh, learned the other day that in the Civil War, before the Civil War, you could become a doctor by like, passing five of nine classes and just hanging out a sign saying like, I am now a doctor. Um, and when they went through the Civil War, they saw that most of the death was from disease and infections rather than battlefield wounds. And as a result, they, they really built up the medical system that spun out of the Civil War. And I was like, oh my God, that's exactly, um, you know, that's making lemonade out of lemons, of course. But you know, how do we have that moment with this crisis now where we, our government can, can learn and build back better? And it's tough because these local and state and, and national government, right? Any, anybody who's, who's responding to the crisis right now is, is in a crisis themselves, both in their job and the amount of things they have to deliver and the time they have to deliver it in and the pressure that they're under, as well as their personal lives, right? They're all sitting at home or 
or they're not sitting at home and that's really hard, right? Whatever their circumstances are, it's hard. Um, but what I, I um, have been thinking about and, and, and they put a piece out on is, is something around what they can do now, right? Which is documentation, which sounds so simple. But, you know, how many times for you as innovators did you try to innovate before and, and how many times were you told no, right? No, that can't work. That can't happen. Here's what, blah, blah, right? And now you can actually hold up examples if you document, we did this in three days. We changed this in two days, right? Here's all the things that happened. You can then create a, a, a dictionary of yes, we can, right? Like, boop, it's going to be a green card instead of a red card, right? You're like, go, go, go. Um, you can get as many, you know, this is the time for the senior leaders to be setting the tone and clearly communicating to people. You should be experimenting. Here's the conditions under which you experiment. You test small, you make sure it works and it doesn't hurt anybody and then go scale it really big. You, um, uh, you, you expose as many employees and staff to that experimentation process as possible. There's a lot of people whose jobs are Kind of on pause and bring them in as expert and you know as as teams of people to help support these experiments so that um, even if it's fast and short they start to build that muscle memory and change those synapses to be more inclined to experiment and, and to change later um, and even in the midst of these budget um, um, budget crises and, and and cities and states are having to look at furloughing is to hire innovators like this isn't the time to cut, your do to cut a couple of dollars on innovation because this is when innovation can really transform your ability to respond under extreme constraints. Um, so I think those are a couple of quick things. Tom, you want to jump in? I really want to, I really want to like just say like yes to Stephanie but then I've got like this dystopian soul at the same time so like I've got I've got like pessimism bias for a change even though my company's motto is militant optimism but there we go um like I, I do I do agree with all of that and I think I probably agreed more so and I might just be tired right now but like two or three weeks ago I would have probably just said yes and stopped but um I think that the challenge we have is that the light always underestimates the dark uh, and we always think we're our, our optimism bias and our hope is our biggest enemy uh, whereas the people who are our actual enemy the people who do want to remain in a world of closed government broken government proven proving that it isn't a good thing uh, and can't do good for the world and isn't the foundation of capitalism and even if that's all you care about that would be a good thing to recognize um, and instead like we, we've got to be the sort of bureaucracy hackers and these, you know, we need to do the sort of black ops stuff ourselves in order to make sure we're in the right rooms, we're building the structures, that the budgets are moving to the right place, that those who were the wrong people to hold power previously are not in the rooms that are building the future. Whereas everything I'm seeing right now is the past snapping back into place to take us into the future, which looks remarkably like the past. Um, and so for me, it's about how can we make sure that we're not casual about our optimism, that we retain that heart and that spirit and that vision, but that we also have possibly people like me with a dark soul to actually be in the places to make sure that we win the arm wrestles and the fights that are coming our way to make sure that all of the gains that we've had over the last two or three months are consolidated and codified and built into the future that we have ahead of us. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Stefan, do you want to have the last word of the session? Or do we, should we stop with, with Tom's excellent? No, I, I had an idea, but I, I forget it. Uh, no, no, no conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's actually the perfect way to end, no conclusion. Uh, I think all of these sessions have no conclusion and they're all full of hope and dystopian thoughts and all full of complexity and nuances and, and in, in midst of, um, of, of all this messiness around us. So, um, so I, I just want to thank you all for, for joining us. Um,